very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maria Boutsinas. I'm the Executive Director of the National Ethnic Press and Media Council of Canada. And I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Thank you for joining us on Press Freedom Day 2015. It is my pleasure to introduce our Master of Ceremonies this evening, two fine gentlemen, Mr. Tony Ruprecht, and the King of Diversity, Senor Roberto Hausman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to World's Press Freedom Day 2015. And as you notice, yeah, let's give it a round of applause for that. As you might have noticed, no matter what the weatherman said, we made arrangements, so by the time you arrive, there is absolutely no rain, no storm, no thunder, nothing. We cannot guarantee when you go, but when you came back, I didn't see a single umbrella. So yes, National Ethnic Media Press made that arrangement. Let's give it up for Thomas, he's the one who did it. Well, Roberto talking about Thomas. He is our incomparable president. Wouldn't you agree? Without, without Tom, without his ideas, without his commitment to our cause to ensure that the ethnic press is not only represented, but that the ethnic press is known throughout the country. And without his leadership, ladies and gentlemen, there simply would not be this meeting tonight, nor the ethnic press as a symbol of multiculturalism throughout this country. Let's then bring him up, our incomparable president, Tom Saras. First of all, I would like to thank you all. It's unbelievable. We are here. This is a successful We remember all those we lost in the year 2014, about 101 uh, colleagues for the year 2015. <clears throat> and this day comes to remind us, all of us, the job we are doing and the recognition we are receiving. Now, believe it or not, I'm not the person who is crying or complaining. If we had any other event, and uh, either the Premier or the Prime Minister was not there, I should not say anything. But when you, you call someone and say to him, come with us, to celebrate the memory of those we lost from this profession, then of course we feel very bad. Tonight, not the Prime Minister, he was the very last moment I learned that till to the last moment they told me that he is going to attend. And then two days before, they sent me an email and they said, I'm, I'm sorry, he has to go to Europe, and he left. And of course, he, today I know very well that he is in Europe, in the Netherlands, for the end, they are celebrating the end of the Second World War. And of course, our friend, Kathleen Wynne, which is with us almost every year and everywhere, I'm surprised today her office informed me that the Premier cannot attend, so I was a little bit upset. And when I'm upset, I don't give a damn if it's the Prime Minister or the Premier. This is Tom Sars. All my life, all my life, I spend it serving the people and the government of Canada and Ontario and Quebec. And I'm proud of my life. The only one who has reasons to complain about my life is my wife, because she lives in misery and in isolation all her life. But she's still with me, and this is very good. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tony. 
This, yesterday, I believe, someone sent me an email and said, send me the agenda. And I was looking at myself and I said, he's joking. I had no time to go to my house and he was asking or she was asking the agenda. And then this morning, another person from the Premier's office said, you didn't send us the agenda. And I said, how do you expect me to send an agenda, to send an agenda if I don't know who to the hell is coming? <laughs> Tell me if you can't, I'll put the agenda. So <clears throat> those are things that we are facing daily. Uh, another thing that I want to, I, I hope that he's going to arrive even later, Mr. Tom Hefner. He's here? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> At least we have our speaker. This is the greatest. So, to this extent, I'm out of here, and either Tony or whoever comes up here, thank you very much again for being with us. And special thanks to the chief of the police. We came all the way down here, sir. And thank you for giving me the opportunity the other day to open my bloody mouth and say all those things. I don't know how many hear them, but I said them. Thank you. Now, Thomas, by the way, because he's the one who organized all of this, is the only one that has the right to speak for more than two minutes. Because the orders I have is that every speaker coming that whether Tony or I announce has two minutes, and in fact it says maximum. So having said that, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce a friend of mine who is in the business of having daughters. Him and I never learned how to make sons. So both of us have quite a few daughters. And the one that I'm talking about is a great guy, fun, exciting, never boring. The one and only city councilor, Jim Carijams. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have to tell you, I had to go and visit Tom. Now I just walked down the stairs. <coughs> His office is right below mine. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm not sure the great turnout is it due because I'm in city council and I'm attracting people, or is it because of Tom? I think it's because of Tom. Thank you for coming. I have a statement to read, and welcome everybody on behalf of city council and Mayor Jordori. May 3rd is World Press Freedom Day, a time to talk about violations of press freedom. It's a time to remember that in many countries around the world, the media is censored, fined, suspended, and closed down, while journalists, editors, and publishers are harassed, attacked, kidnapped, and even murdered. Just as importantly, it's time to encourage and develop initiatives in support of press freedom and to access the state of press freedom throughout the world. World Press Freedom Day was established in 1991 by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in the United Nations Department of Public Information at a conference in Woodhock, Namibia. It's proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly in 1993. Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedoms to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impact information and ideas throughout any media and regardless of frontiers. Well, Press Day is a time to reflect upon the sacrifices brave men and women have made throughout the years telling important stories about events that shape our world. I want to thank everybody for being here today and to my uh, federal and uh, municipal colleagues. Welcome to my new home. office. You think, I got a corner office. It's got a great view. It overlooks. It overlooks. Uh, you know the speaker's corner and overlooks at the uh, over outside the United Nations. I mean the United States. And if there's only any any anything, I always get to see it. Everybody knows Jim Karigianis. I know him very well. This is our thank for coming down. It's your name. Well, you get something that it says council. Uh, you see, the funny thing is, we have a mayor who used to be for one and a half year a journalist. That's how he was doing before he elected. 
but tonight he thought that he is the mayor and therefore he cannot come down here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this evening we have the great pleasure to welcome the youngest member of parliament in of course, in Ontario. She not only is the youngest member of parliament, she's also the deputy critic of heritage. Please welcome Radhika Sitsabayasan from Scarborough Rouge River. Good evening, everyone. Okay, some of you know how this works. I'm going to lean on you to help the others. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Now you can start my two-minute clock, because that didn't count. Um, so my name is Radhika, Radhika Sitsabayisan, and I'm the federal member of parliament from Scarborough Rouge River. I'm here to give a few words on behalf of the leader of Canada's official opposition, leader of Canada's NDP, uh, Thomas Mulcair. And before I read Tom's greetings, I just want to say on my behalf, thank you. Thank you for all of the work that you do as the ethnic press in this country. Thank you for speaking the languages and making sure that everything that's happening in this country, the messages are being received by the millions of people in this country in the language that they speak, in the language that they read, in a language that they understand. Because if it wasn't for the work that you are doing, so many of our constituents, my constituents at Scarborough Rouge River, but so many Canadians wouldn't be receiving the mail, the messages that need to be received through the media because a lot of the national media do miss a lot of the important things that you are all reporting on. So thank you. Especially in a climate where in 2015 alone, 44 journalists have died in the line of duty in 2015 so far. And according to Journalists Without Borders, there's currently 108 journalists who are imprisoned around the world. And every day, journalists around the world face threats, face imprisonment, intimidation, and are attacked just for doing the work that they're doing. And I know, I know many of you personally, and I know some of your stories. Some of you have been journalists imprisoned in another country for doing the work that you're doing so bravely today. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing the work that you do. And I'll very briefly, quickly read Tom's message. And it reads, Dear friends, on behalf of Canada's New Democrats, I am pleased to extend greetings to everyone gathered to mark World Press Freedom Day. This is an opportunity to recognize the important work that journalists and news organizations undertake despite the challenges and risks inherent to their jobs. Their work of defending democratic principles and freedom of, freedom of expression and bringing what is hidden out into the light serves the entire world. Today, we also pay tribute to journalists who have lost their lives while doing their jobs. It is unacceptable that in 2015, members of the media are still prosecuted, persecuted, and even killed for simply doing their jobs. So far this year, 27 journalists have been killed. I have a newer number, clearly. Attacks against press freedoms must not be taken lightly. Together, we must remain vigilant to ensure that freedom of the press and media, media independence, be respected. New Democrats thank journalists and the media for their important work of uncovering the truths and informing the public. Let's work together to stop the attacks on freedom of the press. I wish you an inspirational evening as you continue the valuable work of defending press freedom. Sincerely, the Honourable Thomas Mulcair, Leader of the Official Opposition in Canada's New Democrats. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you to you, Rika, for coming down. We appreciate, you know, and we appreciate, but you are one of us. So thank you for coming down. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, which I have known her for many years, 
And you know how they say that behind every great man there is a pretty woman? Or behind a brain there is a pretty face or something? Well, this lady is both. A lot of brains and pretty. And I have seen her being the brain behind several ministers when I have been there to hear the minister speak. But I know that the one who did the work behind the scenes was her. So I'm so happy to say that she has really earned her wings to be an MPP. Indira Naidu Harris. Great to introduce you here. Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, good evening, everyone, and honored guests. It is such a thrill and a pleasure and an honor to be here with you tonight. I'm also here with my uh, fellow colleague, MPP Sue Wong, and uh, you know we are we are thrilled to be here. Uh, once again, I bring greetings this evening from, of course, the Premier and our colleagues at Queen's Park. I want to start out by telling you all how pleased I am to see so many familiar faces. Over the years, I've spent much time with many of you. As some of you know, I am a former journalist, so I know what it's like to sit on the other side there, to sit on the other side of the camera, to sit on the other side of the desk, to be the person asking the questions, and I know what the job is like, and I know how hard you all work. I'd like to begin by thanking the National Ethnic Press and Media Council of Canada for putting on this World Press Freedom Day celebration. This day is important. It's important because for one day every year, we take a moment, just a moment, to think about the amazing contributions that our fellow journalists have made in the name of freedom. And ultimately, in the end, these people have made the ultimate sacrifice. They fought for freedom, they fought for a voice for all of us, and they've given up their lives doing it. I'd also like to congratulate, of course, Tom Saris, Mr. Saris, the president of the National Ethnic Press and Media Council of Canada, for his great enthusiasm and hard work over the years. Mr. Saris, I've lost count how many years I've known you, but I've known Tom for many years, and I know that he is the driving force behind this group. I've spoken with him many times, sometimes on the phone, late at night, sometimes early in the morning, and I know that he lives and breathes journalism, and he lives and breathes uh, the, the work of being a diverse voice for our communities. You play such an important role in promoting multiculturalism and strengthening our diverse communities. You know, every democracy in the world depends on an active and free press. There are too many places around the globe where the media is censored, where journalists are prevented from speaking freely and telling the real story. Having been born outside this country, in South Africa, under apartheid, I have some experience with the harsh realities and consequences of a state-controlled media. I know what it's like to live someplace where the whole story isn't told and where journalists actually lose their lives in the process of trying to tell that story. It leaves people without a voice, without freedom, and without hope. Fortunately, in Ontario and Canada, we are committed to freedom of expression and understand the true value of freedom and the press. Our government has made it a priority to work closely with the thousands of different ethnic communities across Ontario, and I'm proud that we are doing that, and we could not accomplish it without all of you. You all play a very important role. So, your stories touch the lives of so many people, capture the events, views, and issues that are important to Ontarians and Canadians. Your work is invaluable, and I want to thank you for your hard work your vision, and helping us keep a strong, free, and open society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Indira. I'm very pleased to be here as a member of provincial parliament, but more importantly, to protect the word freedom, because oftentimes, as Canadian, we take advantage, and we don't respect the word freedom, what it really means to live in a free society. But more importantly, as a Canadian whose first language is not English, uh, but I also want to say to thank to each one of you because every day you have the courage and determination because 
without their courage, and when we just heard from Thomas and others to talk about um, journalists being killed recently, and every year we, we have to remember those who, who, who took that courage to write that story so that everybody here and everybody knows about these stories. So I want to say thank you very much on behalf of the government, but more importantly for myself, because my mother and my father watched the news every day and said, did you hear and did you listen? So thank you so much for your courage, your determination, and please continue to write those stories. And disregard those who don't believe in your story, because you know you're telling the truth. So thank you. Of course, both arrived the very last moment. I didn't know anything. I apologize. I did prefer personal plugs for them. I promise. If I will be alive next time, I will prepare one. If not, my wife will be happy. She's going to have a life. So thank you very much, both Indira and Sue. Uh, please accept this plaque on behalf of Minister Chen, who is busy tonight. <laughs> Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce one of the great chiefs of the province of Ontario. Not only he's a great chief, but he is like CP24. He's everywhere. Because all throughout the year, for the last 10 years or 15 years that we know each other, whichever event I go, whether it's the Ghana event or the Jamaican event or the Filipino event or the Planet Africa event, Chief Jolifi is always there. And sometimes he goes with his wife. But it is great to have Chief Jolifi with us, as he always is, behind the National Ethnic Media Press. So Chief Jolifi, thank you so much for coming. And no, you do not have two minutes. You can take a little bit longer. Thank you for that uh, very, very kind introduction. And uh, I'm glad I did take up Thomas's uh, invite. Uh, thank you, Thomas, again, for, uh, for uh, allowing me to travel south of Steeles Avenue. Uh, and uh, I, I must commend the mayor, it took us 20 minutes to come south of Steel tonight, so, so it's all good. I just, uh, on behalf of all the men and women of York Regional Police, I just want to extend uh, my appreciation for your kind invite and uh, check neck to recognize uh, the National Ethnic Press and Media Council's commemoration of the World Press Freedom Day. And uh, as many of you may know, um, our, our global community, our global community of York Region continues to have the proud distinction of being one of the most diverse communities in Canada, with residents who trace their heritage and ancestry to all the corners of the world. And in this regard, uh, Mr. Saris, we commend you for your stellar work towards the promotion of excellence in journalism. And this uh, significant work has expressed in uh, your statement of principles regarding freedom of speech, fairness, diversity, the right to privacy and public interest, as well as your ethical guidelines, ensures that we listen to and acknowledge Canada's other voices in this, our nation of nations. And your leadership and action, which speaks louder than words, is indeed a testament to the rich diversity of our Canada, and it exemplifies the motto of your regional support. Police, which is deed speak. So as we gather here this evening in commemoration of the World Press Freedom Day, let us also renew our collective commitment to advancing the principles of human rights through the practices of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and respect for all people <coughs> in our global community each and every day. And I want to extend my personal thanks, Thomas, and the members of the National Ethnic Press Council and uh, convey my best wishes on behalf of all our membership for the years to come. Need speak. Thank you very much. Just, just to tell you that the Chief is our honorary president for life. Therefore, it should be very bad if he was not here today. But let me inform our podcast. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Tom is the executive director of the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression. He has worked for publications across Canada, including McLean's and the Toronto Star. Now he works in defense of press freedom, free expression, and the public's right to know in Canada and across the world. It certainly is our pleasure, and on behalf of all of us, welcome Tom, and I'd like for you to come and say a few words. is obviously a very, very busy time for CJFE. Uh, we're releasing our annual publication tomorrow, so that's... Uh, but anyway, we made it in time for this one, so that's an important thing. Uh, now, uh, I believe in brevity, so I'm going to be very brief tonight. Uh, but it is important on this day, uh, on World Press Freedom Day, that we remember, that we reflect on what it is that uh, that I'm basically doing year-round, that you as members of the Ethnic Press in Canada are doing year-round, that the journalists across the world and in Canada are doing year-round, and that is defending press freedom. The world has changed for journalists, unfortunately. It is a very difficult time to be a journalist, unfortunately. We now have, as there was no time in the past, Journalists are targets. They're targets from militants. They're targets from criminals. Uh, if you look at a place like Mexico, where, where gangs are, uh, are so frequently murdering journalists, taking them hostage, uh, we are targeted by corporations uh, with frivolous lawsuits, whether that be in Canada, whether that be in Latin America, whether that be overseas in, uh, in Africa or Europe or Asia. And we are targeted, I think, more than ever by governments. There are, uh, in the past, in 2014, there were 100 journalists killed around the world. So far, there have been 34 journalists killed in 2015. Uh, there are 221 journalists jailed. And the numbers, unfortunately, uh, as you may have noticed, will fluctuate from organization to organization because it is so difficult to know uh, when a journalist has been killed, uh, when they've been kidnapped, because Many just disappear. Uh, governments don't keep any numbers on these, uh, depending on what country they're in. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's difficult. And as I said, things have changed. We have, at CJFE, we run what's called the Journalist in Distress Fund. Uh, it gives emergency grants to journalists uh, who are in trouble around the world, pays for things like relocation to new countries, um, for uh, emergency surgery, uh, if a journalist is in, is in uh, uh, if a journalist's life is in danger, it also pays to um, to uh, occasionally bring journalists to Canada. Pays for legal defense, things like that. Uh, this year, we have had the request to the Journalists in Distress Fund more than double uh, over last year. And there are high-profile <laughs> stories that illustrate this, but there are so many names that we don't know. Um, journalists overseas, and, and unfortunately, that I can't tell you because their lives are their lives are in danger, and it's uh, this work needs to be kept confidential. But we are aware of some of these stories, of the story of James Foley and Kenji Goto and Stephen Sotloff, all of whom were executed by ISIS. And this doesn't represent a normal situation. Journalists go overseas. They, uh, they work in, uh, in war-torn regions. Freelancers on the ground uh, work for organizations here in war-torn regions. They work for the press there, and they're persecuted regularly. But ISIS uh, and the threat that it re represents is something very different. For the first time, journalists have been targeted as PR tools. It used to be that we were the people that got the message out for everyone. We gave a voice to everyone, no matter who that was. But with the advent of social media and the internet and, and the increasing rise of militarism and destabilization around the world, unfortunately, journalists now are not as valuable uh, to these organizations like ISIS um, to, get the, to get their uh, message out. They are much more valuable as a spectacle for the world, a violent, deadly spectacle. 
And that, unfortunately, means that journalists are dying. That they're being killed, that they're being targeted like never before, that they're less safe than they ever were, especially abroad. We also had Charlie Hebdo, which waged an what ISIS did in 2014, changing the game, Charlie Hebdo did again. Because where journalists were used to be, uh, it, 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 it unfortunately has become too normalized to have journalists killed in war-torn regions. But it was very strange to have so many murdered in one day in Paris. It was no longer safe for journalists, even in Western democracies. We were getting a taste of what our allies across the world had. And it's, it's, uh, it's very hard, it's very troubling. And unfortunately, it's probably not gonna slow down. This probably isn't the last time it's going to happen. But while that happens, we need to remember what we're fighting for. What we're fighting for is free expression, for human rights, for press freedom, and to still continue to give everyone a voice, regardless of whether there are those who are seeking to kill or stop or silence us, whether that is a corporation or a militant organization or a government, it doesn't matter. Uh, the end game is, is often all the same. And so I want to talk very briefly about the situation in Canada right now. And uh, not just in Canada, but in, in many Western countries. As a response to uh, these terrible things that have happened, to the growth of ISIS, uh, to uh, the shooting in Ottawa, which didn't target the press, but still targeted uh, a core pillar of our democracy to the Charlie, the Charlie Hebdo shooting. Governments have become too tempted to trade our rights for the illusion of security, to trade press freedom for security, for what they, what they say is security, by increasing digital surveillance, the, uh, the untold bulk collection of uh, Canadians' information, a massive, massive, huge-scale violation of the privacy of every, of every Canadian and every American citizen, and one can imagine uh, every British and France citizen, because they all have very similar programs. Uh, the government in Canada has also sealed up the public's right to know. It used to be that you could, uh, as a journalist, you could call a federal scientist and, and be able to speak to them. Uh, that you could get information out of them, that, that government research would be released, that it was actual publicly accessible documents. It used to be that as a journalist or a member of the public, you could file what's called an access to information request. And I mean, I don't need to explain that to any members of the press here, but for those of the public who don't know, that's basically, there's public information that exists, whether it's emails between an MP, uh, between MPs, uh, statistical data, government research, anything like that. You have a right to view that information as long as it doesn't compromise national security or a few other uh, reasons why. But our government has shut that down, and it's, 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 a, it's a problem across the provinces, across the federal government, across municipalities as well. And, uh, and they've done it. They, if you file a request, it will take months and months and months to get it back, and odds are, if you do get something back, it'll be covered in black ink. It's ironic that we call it an access to information. It should be called an access to blank documents, redacted documents. And that has caused a huge threat to journalism in Canada because it is made in a time of austerity in the journalistic world, investigative journalism has become even more difficult to conduct because these requests have been shut down. And not only that, but the government politicians won't speak to the media anymore uh, in many cases. Uh, as I said, federal scientists can. And uh, even the government has actually come after charities uh, luckily, CGFE doesn't have charitable status, but one of our sister organizations, Pan Canada, does. And they were hit with an audit from the Canada Revenue Agency that threatens their very status as an organization. And it wasn't because they've done anything wrong. It was because they're outspoken critics and outspoken advocates for free expression and press freedom. It's a direct attack on the people fighting for these rights from our government. And that is a reprehensible, reprehensible thing to have happen in this country. In Canada, on World Press Freedom Day, it is important to remember that we do have free expression rights and that we enjoy them. But it's also important to remember that just as fragile as they are in many other countries, they are just as fragile here. We enjoy them now, but they can still be taken away. They can still slip away. And at this moment, with bills like C-51,
C-54, and other bills like that, expanding the surveillance state and shuttering our civil service and shuttering our federal scientists, as, that, as those bills pass, so too does our freedom of expression begin to slip away. And it is important, it is important now more than ever that we fight back. And thankfully, for the first time last year, we conducted a poll. And we found that Canadians were angry that there was so little openness uh, in, uh, in government, uh, that there was so little transparency. But they weren't, they weren't angry about it. They weren't as aware as they might be. And I'm very, very pleased to tell you that that has changed. We conducted that same poll this year. Um, and this is that publication that I was telling you about that releases tomorrow. It's called The Review of Free Expression in Canada. All of this information will be available there, but I want to leave you with some good news. 94% of Canadians want scientists to speak freely. 85% of Canadians are concerned about digital surveillance and the collection of metadata. 87% want more openness around digital monitoring. And a full 95% of Canadians want more openness and transparency in government. Canadians are starting to wake up. Canadians are starting to care. Canadians are starting to demand change. And today, on World Press Freedom Day, this is the time that we do it. This is the time that we fight back. And this is the time that we demand our right to free expression. Thank you. Tonight, we lost a gentleman, one of our members, who really was a fighter, a Sri Lankan, I believe, a Tamil, well, Tamil Indian, but it was a wonderful person and a man who really loved the world. So, at this point, I will appreciate if any, all, the, my, all my colleagues pay just a minute of silence, please, in the memory of all those we lost and our members that also we lost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. World Press Freedom Day. And uh, we personally know that every one of the newspapers that are represented here had an article calling on various governments that they came from to try to ensure that, that all those who, uh, who have been killed in the fall of duty are not only remembered, but to call on those governments who are guilty of these crimes that they should change and become more open and more responsible not only to their citizens, but certainly to those who are of the press. So thank you very much, Mr. Hennefer. And now let's go on. Thank you. Berto, we're now into the section to introduce our special guests. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to call the names of some people that um, we would like to acknowledge. And that means that they are really part of the whole, um, the whole big scope of events because nothing happens with one individual or three or five. Everybody's part of this whole uh, event and the principles that we stand by and we stand for. So the acknowledgments will go to people that are with us, behind us, and hand in hand with what we're doing. And I'm gonna acknowledge, and as I call your names, I would like you just to stand, please, so people can recognize you. Superintendent William Sadler with your regional police. I don't think that Armand Labarge and Gina Agustin are here, but they were certainly people that we wanted to acknowledge, but Mr. Kingsley Gilliam, 
Director of Social Services and Health Jama Jamaica Diaspora. University, Dr. George Gekas. Please stand. Sergeant Paul Chan, Diversity and Cultural Resources. <laughs> Peter Kuttenbrauer, who is the senior writer of the National Post. <laughs> Fati Yegru, who is the executive vice president of, of the Intercultural Dialogue Institute. Also, Ms. Wendy Bodnov, Media Relations Toronto International Microfinance Summit. Are you here? Let's acknowledge you. Yes. Dr. Phyllis Bidia from the Toronto General Hospital. Ms. Liz West, a TV journalist and co-host of Square Off on CHCH. Is she here? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Katerina Saras. Where are you? Mr. Spiro Voitsinas. Spiro, uh, stand up, please. <laughs> Professor Dr. Feridun Ramani. <laughs> Mohamed Bukhari. And Mr. Francesco Sorbara. Now you know why they chose Tony and I to come up with these names. Only immigrants can do this. <laughs> By the way, we keep saying, please stand, right? Some of you guys are standing, so at least raise your hand, right? Because I can see you from here, but not the rest. The next one is Madi Dimuccio, your regional taxpayers' federation. That's an important one, yeah. Stacy Perry, MPPL B Stellar Consulting Group. And Mark Daprato, Chief Marketing Officer at shop.ca. Now, just a few more, and that's Alexandra, Alexandra, Cristo Doneta, who is the Trade Commissioner from the Greek Consulate. Please stand. And there's a man who saw me in my boxer shorts. How many of you see me in my boxer shorts? I hope I was. <laughs> Now, if he's a man, oh my God, there's something going on here right now. But, uh, but uh, this man, of course, we, uh, we had a few days together, and that's why he saw me by boxer shorts. <laughs> Stop right there. Don't laugh too hard, okay? <laughs> to make a long story short, let me introduce Dr. Aubrey Zeidenberg, who is from Bene Birth International. Aubrey. And then we have a special cards, right? Dr. Vida Gayan Tota Maharaj, who is the Consul General of the Consulate General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. There's a, there's, a nominated, there's a nominated candidate here, uh, Liberal Todd Ross, Toronto Danforth. You can stand up too. There's a right there. And by the way, from the Greek Consulate, for those of you that understand Greek, I should have said Kalispera Orea Copella. <laughs> Which means, hello, beautiful woman, would you like to see me later on so we can go for it? No, no, that's... <laughs> All right, and one more uh, announcement before... Oh, did we acknowledge Vidya Gian, Consul of Trinidad and Tobago? We did. I love Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Just kidding, I want to know who she is, I can talk to her. All right, and I don't know about you guys, but how many of you likes the CNE. How many of you like the CNE? It's one of the very first places I ever went to when I came to this country. And I said, wow, everything here is fun and games. And I like that. So we have from the CNE Mark, and I know you are here because I have your cards, Mark Montpet, Montpetit and Gilbert Estefan. Where are you, please? From the CNE. Thank you so much for being here. And yes, we are going to the CNE. The way that Roberto said he went to the scene when he first came to this country. You know why he really went? Because he thought everything was free. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about free. We have a band coming up now. And MVP has just arrived, Mr. Todd Smith. Where are you? Todd Smith? Come on forward, please. Wouldn't be the same without you. At least take the acknowledgement. 
It's going to save you. All right. I won't, I won't be too long. Thank you, former MPP. Um, a great pleasure to be here on behalf of my colleagues in the PC Ontario Caucus. My name is Todd Smith. I'm the member of Provincial Parliament for Prince Edward Hastings Riding in Eastern Ontario, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Yeah. 